This is the NADC 316B version 2 integrated amplifier, but for the sake of my sanity, I'm just going to refer to it as the 316V2 from this point moving forward. And this is going to be a component that a lot of you have asked me to review, so here it is, and in today's video, I'm going to go over its performance and talk about what it brings to the table. So yeah, let's roll the intro. All right guys, so here it is, the 316 V2, stand not included. Now what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna briefly go over what it is that you get with this integrated amp. We're gonna take a look at the front, take a look at the back, take a look under the hood, and then I'm gonna talk about how it actually performs. And because this is the 316B, there's no way I can move forward without at least acknowledging its history because this integrated can trace its lineage all the way back to the legendary NAD3020 integrated amplifier. Now that integrated amplifier was released in the late 70s and it made an absolute splash. In fact, one could argue that that's the product that built the NAD brand because at the time there was nothing else like it. It was slim, it was powerful, it was dynamic, it had really good sound quality to it, and most importantly it was very very affordable. And this unit is the direct descendant of the 3020. Now, the 316 was actually released in 2010, and the version 2 that you're looking at right here was released last year. Now, there's not going to be much of a difference between the version 2 and the regular 316, except for some minor aesthetic changes. There's going to be curves on the side now instead of it being flat, and this unit's going to come with a high-quality moving magnet phono stage. Now, this unit retails for $399 US dollars, and it comes with a remote. This review sample doesn't have it though, so I can't really show it off. So what we're going to do now is we're going to take a look at the front and start from left to right. So over here we're going to have our power on and off switch. When it's on, the lights are going to illuminate blue. When you turn it off, you're going to get a red color. We're going to have our 1 fourth headphone jack. Now this amp will output 2 volts to the headphone jack. We have our analog input buttons, tuner, auxiliary video, CD. Phono. This is going to stand for media player. And that leads me to this. This is going to be a 3.5 millimeter input. Over here we have our tone controls. Now you can defeat them. I really like them. The treble's done at around, if I remember correctly, 10k, and the bass is going to be done at 100 hertz. Now the cool thing is, whenever I select the tone controls, I genuinely can't tell the difference between whether or not they're on or off. They're buffered, and they also are done in a way to prevent the amplifier from being overdriven. Over here we have our balance control for a left to right channel balance. We have our volume control, which feels pretty decent. And now let's take a look at the back. All right, so as you can tell, there's not a whole lot going on here. So going from left to right, we have a place for a ground if you need it. We have our phono stage. We have our four analog inputs. We have our five-way speaker terminals. And then we're going to have this thin molded plastic power cord that comes attached to the unit. And the funny thing here is that this just shows that you don't need a garden hose size power cord in order to get the power that you need from the wall. Now let's take a quick peek inside and then we'll talk about how it sounds. All right, guys, so as usual, I'm going to have to go handheld for this section. And the first thing that I want to draw your attention towards is this. NAD, do you think you guys used enough screws to secure the top plate? Man, it's going to be a whole lot of fun to put back on. Anyways, onto the circuit itself. As you can tell, the 316 uses a fairly simple yet beautiful looking circuit. It's a high current Class AB design with a Class A drive stage. It'll output 40 watts into both 4 and 8 ohms, with the whole idea being that there's going to be enough bandwidth left over to handle dynamic peaks, and also it'll allow the amplifier to handle difficult loads with ease. Over here, we're going to have a 350 volt toroidal transformer. We have our heat sink. We have our output transistors. I believe they use Toshiba output transistors. We have our filter caps that are believed to be 10,000 microfarads a piece, giving you a total of 20,000. We have our phono stage, decent volume control, and overall, looks to be a very solid, simple circuit. So now let's talk about how it actually sounds. All right, guys, so to get things started, I need to share just a little bit of history with you all. That way you know where I'm coming from with this review. 
So the thing is this, I've actually owned a number of different NAD integrated in the past, and it all started with the C370. In fact, that was my first true hi-fi integrated amplifier, and I loved that thing. It was a beast. And then they replaced it with the 372, which I later bought, and then they released the Master Series M3, which was at the time their flagship piece, and I absolutely loved that thing as well. And the reason why I bring this up is because no matter what product I heard or where I heard it at, whether it's my own room, at a dealer showroom, at a trade show or at a friend's place, all the components more or less had the same house sound. Slightly lively treble with the rest of the presentation being pretty warm. And the big question is, does the 316 V2 have that same house sound? Well, let's talk about it. Okay, so now that you all have some context and that smooth transition is out of the way, let's go ahead and talk about the performance of the 316 V2. And let's start off by addressing the thing that I just brought up. Does the 316 V2 have the same character as the units that I used to have back in the day? And the answer is no, not really. And I say that because when you kick back and you listen to the 316 V2, what you're going to get is a sound that's lively, dynamic, and on the forward side of neutral. And funnily enough, the voicing isn't what you would expect it to be when I say those words. Because normally when I say that, it means that the treble is going to be boosted and the mid-range is going to be thin. But instead, what's really happening here is that while the treble is boosted a little bit, it's actually the mid-range that informs the character of this integrated amplifier because it does project in a forward way and it's going to be very, very prominent. Now, they didn't go with the V-curve voicing here. Instead, the bass is actually going to be pretty articulate and clean for something at this price range. And overall, I think this is a very smart direction to go in because NAD realizes that a lot of people who buy this integrated, it's going to be their first proper high-end piece. And when somebody connects their speakers to it, they're going to want to experience that, wow, this is lively and engaging. The music is so prominent and it just makes for a really good impression, never mind a good listening experience. I also like this voicing because it enables itself to sound really good and full at low level listening, which is where I listen most of the time. Now, what I want to do here is focus on a couple strengths that I feel are pretty unique to the 316 V2 for the price, starting with dynamics. You look at this unit and you think, eh, it's not going to be that dynamic. I mean, it's slim. It's only 40 watts per channel. But the fact that they built in so much bandwidth into the circuit really enables it to give you really good dynamic range, both micro and macro. And I would say it's definitely cut above Denon and Emirates and the usual suspects, again, at this price point when it comes to dynamics. Also, the noise floor is going to be very low. Even when I connect the clip speakers to it, there's going to be no hiss, which is something that I always appreciate. And now let's just go ahead and go over the other parameters. Starting with the treble, as I mentioned before, the treble is going to be on the forward side of neutral, but honestly, it's not that forward. And if you don't like it, just use the tone controls and tone it down. As simple as that. The treble is not going to be the most refined sounding presentation on planet Earth. It's not going to be the most airy, but it gets the job done. And I think for the money, it's pretty satisfactory. The mid range, of course, is going to be what this integrated amplifier is all about, but it's not going to be about warmth like the older units. Instead, it's about energy and prominence and about really putting the music forward to give you that you are there in the musical event sensation. And then we have the bass. The bass is going to be strong. Look, it's not going to be for bass heads who expect an amp like this to just really fill the room with super deep bass. Instead, it's going to be more about articulation. Next, let's talk about imaging. So when I connect speakers like the Totems or the Amphions to this, speakers that cast a wide stereo image, I notice that through this integrated amplifier, that image becomes more limited to the physical plane of the speakers. So this isn't going to be for imaging hounds. But I will say the focus in between those speakers is very good and the instrument placement and channel separation is going to be very good as well. Now. Ultimately, I would say that, yeah, this is going to be a good piece. It's definitely, I think, geared more towards somebody who's just getting into the gig. And it does have a very unique sound, which means some people are going to love it, some people aren't. And that leads me to some of the caveats. So here's the thing, everyone. I feel like whenever you criticize a product, you always need to bear in mind who this product was geared towards. Now, even though it's lifestyle size, this isn't really a lifestyle solution. So they didn't bother including a DAC or the ability to stream Bluetooth to the unit directly out of the box. And there's going to be people out there who will have legitimate complaints about that. But again, this is more for the purest audiophile listening experience. If anything, I'd criticize them for not having a dedicated sub out. I think in a North American market and as something at that price point, it's just a smart thing to have. So hopefully they'll include it in the next version. But otherwise, when it comes to complaints, I will say this. 
this product has a very distinct performance envelope. It is on the forward side of neutral and not everyone is going to love that. And tone controls isn't going to affect the mid-range prominence that I told you about. So this is gonna be one of those pieces that you listen to it and either you're really gonna like it or you're probably gonna prefer something else. That's just how the ball bounces in this gig. And that leads me, of course, to my final thoughts. All right, everyone, so let me say this. After spending time with the 316 V2, I understand why so many of you wanted me to review it. Not only is it affordable, well, at least by hi-fi standards, it also has a sound that a lot of people are going to enjoy, especially people who are buying something at this price point. And I say that because when I look to the loudspeaker market and I look at the brands that have always been very successful, they've all voiced their products in a similar way, which is to be on the forward side of neutral, to have this lively presentation and to project energy in a very impressive way. And that's because whenever somebody spends their hard-earned money on a stereo system, they want to sit back and to be impressed time and time again. A good example of this is when I just got into the hobby, the most popular brands were Paradigm and B&W. Nowadays, it's Kef, it's Klipsch, and many other companies. So I think the 316 V2 falls directly in line with that trend, and I think that's smart positioning on their part, and overall, it just proves that even though this component is fairly old in terms of its overall topology, it can still be relevant today and still represent a very solid value. Anyways, that's just gonna be my take on the unit. As always, guys, thanks for watching, and until next time, peace. Okay, everyone, so in this bonus section, I wanna cover two topics that I didn't go over in the main review, starting with the power output capabilities of the 316 V2. Quite frankly, I just straight up forgot to mention it. So when it comes to this integrated amp, it'll output 40 watts into both four ohms and eight ohms, and believe it or not, it's a strong 40 watts. If you have difficult to drive speakers, so long as you're in a medium to small sized room, it shouldn't struggle with them whatsoever. Now clearly, once you start cranking it, you will start to run into distortion, but I think for a lot of people, it's gonna be more than enough power, but clearly, if you live at rock concert volumes, or if you have a big space to fill, then you may want something that's just a little bit more powerful than this. Moving on, let's talk about speaker matching to this integrated amplifier, because I'm sure a lot of you are gonna to wanna to know whether if brand X pairs with this well or not. And overall, I'll say this, number one, it's gonna be difficult for me to say what's gonna work and what isn't because when we're talking about a component at this price point, I have to bear in mind that a lot of people who are buying this, they're first time buyers or maybe second or third time buyers and you just don't have enough experience to even know what it is you like, let alone what's gonna go well according to your taste and the kind of music that you listen to. So in light of having said that, let me recommend this. I think the best pairing is with speakers that are on the warm side of neutral and are gonna be relatively smooth sounding. Let me give you some examples. Speakers from Q Acoustics, Magnapans, a combination that Steve Guttenberg really liked with this integrated amp. Um, Spender, any LS35A type speaker is gonna make for a great match with this integrated. But when it comes to the stuff that, quite frankly, most people buy, monitor audio, Klipsch, Paradigm, B&W, Kef, all of that gear is on the forward side of neutral. And I can't tell you if it's something that you're gonna like or not. You just have to experience it for yourself. Same thing with Totem and Amphion. I think it makes for a good presentation, a very lively and prominent presentation. But some people, especially people who are experienced listeners, are gonna notice that in the upper mid-range, when you pair a forward sounding component with forward sounding speakers, that upper mid-range is gonna kind of beam out at you a little bit. Some people are gonna be sensitive to it, others aren't. It's just something that you're gonna have to try for yourself. But anyways, I don't know if this helped you at all, but I nonetheless wanted to lay down my thoughts and observations on the subject, so hopefully it's helped someone. Anyways, guys, for real this time, take it easy. Thanks for watching and peace.